thank the Lord for his name that we can lift up and exalt far above every other name, ever and always. I was talking to a man this week, and we had a chance to pray with one of the men in the kampoon that we visit. And uh, so I always ask Peter to pray, and be sure he prays in Jesus' name. So this man's wife is having a baby, and she's in the hospital with doing some tests and not feeling well. So we prayed for he and his wife, and we finished praying, and the man said to us, he said, I just, I believe that we all worship the same God. And no matter what you call him, as we pray to him, he hears our prayer. And, you know, we we told him that we we pray in Jesus' name, we pray to the God of creation, um, the God of heaven. So many people in this world don't know who they pray to. They think prayer is a good thing, but really don't know who they're praying to. We're just saying, you are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. And we lift up our Lord's name with great intentionality because he is the one who hears. Just a, a, a brief, quick announcement. Probably in two weeks or three weeks, I think uh, I'm, I'd like to begin a, a series on marriage, family, and serving the Lord as a family. We have a lot of young, young families here. And uh, uh, I'd like to just give some... Some biblical instruction on uh, family. We have many young adults that are not married that maybe I can give you some encouragement on marriage. And so some biblical thoughts on marriage, on family, and on serving the Lord as a family. Um, one thing you, I will emphasize in that is that no matter where your children are in your life, their salvation is a miracle from God. I'll be emphasizing that together as well. This morning... I feel like I have a long sermon, but it only has one point, so you shouldn't get lost in it. It only has one point, the point's in the title, all right? The title is the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit that God bears through us, and that's really the whole sermon right there. The single point of the whole, this whole message is the fruit that God bears through us. A couple weeks ago, Bobby and I were able to go to Kuala Lumpur, and I have to admit, I've never seen so many palm trees in my life. Oil palm trees, or palm oil trees, I guess you call them. I, 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 as we were getting, going, flying across Malaysia, I said, that is hundreds, looks like hundreds of miles of palm tree groves. So I'm kind of ignorant of how they work so this you probably know all of this but oil palm trees begin to bear fruit about three years old they have an average productive life of 25 to 30 years the palm fruit can be harvested 12 months in a year a mature palm tree can grow to reach 20 meters with each fruit bunch contains about 50 percent oil no wonder it's such a great crop. No wonder it's used around the world and supplies so many different varieties of oil and oil usage. But what happens to a, a palm oil tree that stops producing? Does, does the owner honor the tree and take care of it because it used to produce? I mean, it wasn't a good tree for 25 years. Is he going to just let that tree remain for a while in an unfruitful state because it was a good tree? Or is a good tree that stops producing no longer a good tree? Are you with me? A good tree that stops producing is no longer a good tree, right? Jesus cursed a fig tree that was no longer producing fruit. What, what had the tree done wrong? It just stopped producing, and so really it was of no value any longer. The fruit of the Spirit you have inside your bulletin. Can you, I want to give the right translation, so let me get a bulletin so I can read that along with you. All right, so open your bulletin. We'll read the fruit of the Spirit in your memory verse here. But the fruit of the Spirit, if you could read this aloud with me. 
But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. In other words, when we live this way, we are not breaking any of God's law. So we're going to take some time today and talk about fruit. Not specific fruit. We've already done that over the past several weeks, going over the nine fruits of the Spirit. But about fruit in general. In John 15, Jesus said that he is the vine and we are the branches. And the vine, the, 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 the branches cannot bear fruit unless they are attached to the vine. We, the children of God by faith, in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, are attached to the Lord Jesus. He is the vine, we are the branches. We are unable to bear fruit unless we're attached to him. But if we are attached to him, the energy of fruit bearing comes from the vine through us, the branches, and the fruit of the Spirit then comes out through us. Now in Galatians 5.19, to 21, he speaks of the works of the flesh. We're not going to review those. I hope you're familiar with some of those. I know you are because you have bodies of flesh, and Jeff already told us how selfish and self-centered we are. So we know what the works of the flesh, and he says these are manifest, they're evident. They come out of an active evil heart within us. I don't need to try to sin more. It just comes naturally. Those are the works of the flesh. The fruit of the Spirit, as an opposite, does not come from any good place within us. There is nothing good in us for that fruit of the Spirit to naturally spring from. The fruit of the Spirit is a result of the new life that the Holy Ghost puts within us. It is Him who is abiding in us. The, the, the great apostle Paul wrote this, he said, In me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. So, can the fruit of the Spirit come out of us in any natural way? What do you think? Yes or no? Cannot. Because there's nothing good in us. Right? So you might know somebody who is a little more kind than other people. That doesn't mean they're a good person. You might know somebody who, by and large, is more honest than others. That doesn't mean they're a good person. Maybe they've learned some of life's lessons and have tried to work a little bit harder to be a better person, but within them, nothing good dwells. All right, so here's the message today. Three simple points, all pretty much the same. The first point is this. All spiritual fruit begins in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that the energy of fruitfulness comes from. It doesn't come from us. We don't fabricate it. We don't get better at it. We're no, we don't just get good seeds planted in us so all of a sudden we can bear good fruit. It all begins in the Lord Jesus Christ. John 15, 1, Jesus said, I am the vine. I am the vine. Just a short Old Testament lesson for you. The prophets of the Old Testament would call Israel a vine. And they often referred to Israel as a vine that was no longer producing and was headed to God's judgment. And as some of you are reading the Bible with us through us this year, we're going through the books right, book of Ezekiel right now. Is that hard to read for you? That's a challenge to read, isn't it? the book of Ezekiel, because it's all about God's judgment of Israel. But he calls them an unproductive vine. So when Jesus comes and says, I am the vine, he's making a statement to say, I am going to reveal to you what Israel was supposed to be. Think with me just for a moment about Jesus turning the water into wine. The Jews of the Old Testament had stopped producing the spiritual fruit that God wanted them to produce. Jesus comes along, his very first miracle, he demonstrates 
who he is. He is the vine. What does he do as the vine? Well, he produces the best wine ever, but that wine never was seed. It was never a grape on the vine. It was never picked from the vine. It was never crushed into wine. But when the master of the feast drank that wine, what did he say? This is the best I've ever had. Should we be surprised that he who is the vine is able to produce the best wine ever just by his doing so? This is who he is. And so he comes and he says, I am the vine, and I want you attached to me so you can produce fruit through me. Christ made several statements about who he was and who he is. We're just going to run through these, okay, because I want you to understand where all of this energy of fruitfulness comes from. First, he said, I am the way. The Lord Jesus said he is the way in John 14, 6. When, when Israel left, the, left Egypt to go to the promised land, they didn't know the way. What did God do? He sent the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire to lead them from Egypt to the promised land. He showed them the way. We, in this life, are lost in our sin. We don't know how to get to God. We create all kinds of religions to try to find a way to get to God. Jesus comes and says, I am the way. I am the way. Don't follow the broad road to destruction. Follow the narrow path because I am the way. Jesus said he is the light. John 8, 12. Jesus made this proclamation just during a a lighting ceremony at the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. During this ceremony, many lights were lit. The city was lit up. By these lights, illuminated by these lights, Jesus steps into this this temple ground area, now lit with the light of candles, much more than usual. And he says, I am the light of the world. The Feast of Tabernacles only lit the temple grounds. The light of Jesus knows no limits. Perhaps Jesus was alluding to the pillar of pillar of fire by night that led Israel through the wilderness. But the pillar of fire was temporary. Jesus says, I am the light of the world for all who will come to me. The Lord Jesus said, he is the bread of God from heaven. In the, in the, in the wilderness, God gave manna from heaven to the nation. In, in Jesus' lifetime, he fed the multitudes with his bare hands. Out of nothing, ex nihilo, he created food to feed the multitudes. There was showbread in the temple. The purpose of the showbread was to remind the people of God's continual provision of their life. Jesus comes and says, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. I am the bread of life. The Lord Jesus said he is the good shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. The sheepfold of Israel, he said, they are my sheep. But he said, I have sheep outside of Israel as well. There are are sheep of mine of Israel and sheep of mine of the Gentiles who I will also shepherd and guide. The priests of the Old Testament were often called shepherds, and some of them were bad shepherds. And again, our recent reading in Isaiah, he said, I have had shepherds who have led my people astray. So Jesus comes to this this group, this, this culture of who understands both sheep and understands the Old Testament shepherds who failed the Lord and his people. And he says, I am the good shepherd who will give my life for my sheep. The Lord Jesus said he is the door of the sheepfold. No one can come in or out except through him. The Old Testament Jews had to come to God through the door of the tabernacle, the door of the temple. There was no way to get in except through the door of the temple. Jesus says to these people, I am the door. There is no other way to enter into the presence of God except through me. 
Ultimately, as Christ hangs on the cross and says it is finished, the curtain in the temple is ripped in half, and Jesus said, now you can enter into the very presence of God because I am the door. Then the Lord Jesus said that he is the water of life. He is the water of life, not figuratively. He says, I am the water that will satisfy you. We spent time last Sunday with the woman at the well meeting with the Lord Jesus and how Jesus said, I want to completely satisfy you with my water. Drink of me. You'll never thirst again. Do you find it interesting that these are not given as similes? I am like a door. I am like a shepherd. I am, I am uh, like the light you need. I, I am like the bread. He said, I am. These. This is who I am. What, we, what I want you to see in this quick review is that all spiritual fruit begins in the Lord Jesus. He truly is the one in whom all spiritual fruit begins. Not only did he make these statements, but as he made these statements, he revealed who he was compared to the Old Testament that concealed him. He was hidden as it were, in the symbols of the Old Testament. And then he reveals that he is the fulfillment of them all. All spiritual fruit begins in the Lord Jesus. Secondly, the Lord Jesus puts his fruit in us, but he puts his fruit in us when we are saved. When does the Lord put his spiritual fruit in you? From birth? How many of you have had children? You had a baby come into your home. Did that baby come in good? Did the baby come in honest and kind and loving and sweet and, and selfless? Or did the baby come into your home selfish, self-willed, and self-determined? Mine, mine all came in selfish, self-willed, and determined. They knew what they want, when they wanted it, and how to get it. No, spiritual fruit doesn't come in at physical birth. It begins at new birth. You must be born again. At new birth, the spiritual fruit of the Lord Jesus begins in us. We know this because, again, the Lord Jesus said that he is the vine. He is the vine. As I mentioned before, Israel became an unproductive vine thrown into the fire. But Jesus came as the true vine from heaven. Not only did Jesus take ordinary water and make it into the best wine ever, he took ordinary people and made them into missionaries, preachers, proclaimers, followers of him. They couldn't turn themselves and become that. Somebody recently asked, asked me, why did God use such, such poor examples of life in the disciples? You know, Peter was a hothead. Uh, Thomas was a, a natural doubter. We see that throughout Thomas's writing to us. Um, James and John, they, they were men of pride. They wanted to be next to Jesus in his kingdom. Why did Jesus take such poor examples of life and use them to be his disciples? Because as the vine... He took their empty lives and filled them with himself so they would become fruitful for him. I want you to see that when we, those of us saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus, are attached to him, we will bear his fruit through our lives. Not our fruit. We will bear his fruit through our lives when we are attached to him. Others will then see him in us and they should want the fruit that they see. People should say to us, what's different about you? What's different about you? Well, the only answer is the Lord Jesus. Don't ever say, well, you know, I came from a good this, I came from a good that. Don't ever say that. You aren't good because of who you are. You're good because Christ's goodness is in you. And as you bear the fruit of Christ in you, others will see that fruit. And they should be amazed. This is what the fruit of God does in us. 
I don't know if you're familiar with a, a, a Congregationalist pastor from the 1800s, Henry Ward Beecher. Henry Ward Beecher pastored in the U.S. during the Civil War of the U.S. Very difficult time to pastor, for sure. Just a couple of thoughts from him today. Fruit, fruit of the orchard, the garden or the vineyard, is the most perfect form of development to which a tree or plant can come. Fruit is the thing for which all the engineering of roots and branches and leaves was appointed. Why do you plant a fruit tree? For shade? To have fruit. Patrick's always telling me about his, his investments into his trees. They might be more fruitful. This is what we want. A tree is supposed to bear fruit. And Ward Beecher says the most perfect form of development a tree or plant can come is when it bears fruit. Everything else is a servant to the fruit. The branches and the leaves, they, they, they wait. Fruit is the final result. And, and a tree never gets greater than bearing fruit. It may have seasons where it bears less, but it should pick back up again and bear fruit once more. In fact, if you see a, a tree laden with fruit, you go, wow, what a beautiful tree. As we left from, uh, um, I think it was from Bedestagi going to Lake Toba, uh, there was a lot of traffic, and so our driver took a back road. I'm really glad he did. We actually went through an area of the country that was filled with beautiful orchards. There were terraced fields, there were a well-groomed uh, rows of trees, and, and some of the orange trees were just laden with oranges. It was a beautiful sight. That's what a, a, a fruit-bearing tree is a beautiful thing. It's doing what it's supposed to do. One more quote from Henry Ward Beecher. He said, the fruit is the measure of the tree's possibility. Okay, think about that. The fruit is the measure of the tree's possibility. How much fruit can your tree produce? Well, we'll, we'll, work, out, we'll work the ground and we'll see. This year it produced this much. Next year we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can get more. But the, the measure of the tree is the amount of fruit it produces. So, so Beecher went on and said, when we speak of a man or a woman as a fruitful tree or vine, we refer to God's regeneration which brings forth in the Christ follower the highest results of which he or she is capable. Think about that with me. This is a very important point. What is the greatest thing you are capable of doing? Success in what? Success in your field of business? Success in the arts? Music? What is the greatest possible thing that you can do with your life? Well, Beecher says the greatest thing you can possibly do is bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And that when you bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life, you are actually doing what God created you to do, and therefore you are fulfilled. What is ultimate fulfillment in humanity? Early in the, in the early 1900s in the U.S., I think it was 1930s or earlier than that, we had what was called the Great Depression. The stock market crashed. The next day, many people who were millionaires the day before committed suicide. The day before, they had been wildly successful. But when they lost all of their success, they thought they lost their value and purpose. But if our greatest success is producing the fruit of the Spirit in our life, then where, when are we most fulfilled? We read this week in Ezekiel 16. I don't have a slide for it. I just kind of put this up after reading it. Maybe yesterday I read this. God said this about Israel. And your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty. 
for it was perfect through the splendor that I had bestowed upon you, declares the Lord God. Exodus 16 and 14, he said, Israel, you were beautiful because of the beauty that I bestowed upon you. My brothers and sisters, when are we most fulfilled? Are we most fulfilled in our own ability? Or are we most fulfilled when God puts his beauty upon us and we are bearing his fruit in this life? So how do we know if someone else is a follower of Jesus Christ? How do we know if someone else has been born again by the Holy Spirit of God? How do we know that the experiences of somebody else are, are, are brought them salvation? This is a good question. Well, James said we judge each other by the fruit that we bear. Here's the third point. You'll see it's very similar, dealing with fruit. The presence, it should be or, not of, sorry. I just caught that just now. I read this repeatedly. And I just now caught it. The presence or absence of spiritual fruit defines our spiritual condition. You get that? The presence or the absence of spiritual fruit defines our spiritual condition. Now, I've had very sincere people tell me they were okay with God. I asked one lady, how do you know you're saved? How do you know you're a Christian? She's so well. My mother was going to abort me, and her family talked it out of it, and I've been saved ever since. Well, she was saved physically from abortion, but I don't know that she was saved spiritually. I don't know if she understood spiritual salvation. When someone is convinced they're good with God, what, it is, what is it about their life that validates their profession? Because our life should validate what's happened within. I'll tell you a sad story. A man began to come to our church, and told me he was saved, told me he was baptized. But we found out that he had an affair and in, during the affair, he had a child with the woman of the affair. He came back from that repenting and asked forgiveness, and his wife took him back. He had another affair, same woman, and she bore a second child from him. At first, he came back repentive from that second affair. And then he invited me to breakfast one day, and I'm thinking, okay, he's going to really come clean. He's, he, he knows me. He, and we've, he's, we've been together several years, worked through these difficulties together. We sat down to breakfast, and he said to me, I've decided to leave my wife, and this other woman has decided to leave her husband, and we are going to get married. Did this man show the fruit of the Spirit in his life? Very simple, yes or no. He did not. What do we conclude when someone's life and the fruit of their life doesn't agree? Their li I'm sorry, someone's uh, life and lips do not agree. Can we conclude that a person probably does not have the Spirit of God if they claim Christ but have zero fruit in their life? I mentioned James 3 earlier. Let's look at James 3, verses 8 to 18. James said that a good tree, out of the good treasure within, bears good fruit. So a good man or a good woman who knows the good saving grace of God will produce the fruit of the Spirit of God in their life. You agree with this? However, when a person claims to know God but has zero no, not any fruit in their life. We can say they are not filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Why? Because producing fruit is the purpose of the fruit tree. A tree that is not producing fruit is not a good tree. In fact, the absence of spiritual fruit demonstrates the true condition of the lost soul. My friends, there's no in-between. You're not saved and almost saved and close to saved and nearly saved. You're saved or you're lost. 
If you are saved, you are producing spiritual fruit. If you're not saved, you are not producing spiritual fruit. The scripture makes this so clear. So clear. Remember the Lord Jesus cursed the fruitless fig tree, which then withered and died. Why? Because it was not fulfilling its purpose. Theologians think, and I tend to agree, that the cursing of the fig tree was a demonstration of the nation of Israel. They were no longer producing spiritual fruit. And ultimately, Jesus said, we read of Christ, he came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. At one time, Paul washed his hands and said, fine, I leave the Jews, I go to the Gentiles. There are times that the Lord stops working in a person's life. No spiritual fruit, no interest in spiritual fruit. That person finds themselves ultimately condemned by their lack of faith. What if we are, we know we're saved, but we struggle with this? Well, what does the Lord do? He calls himself the vine dresser or the husbandman, an old word. What does the vine dresser do? He clips away the weeds. He takes away anything that might keep the, the energy from producing the fruit. In a human sense, this requires an attitude of submission, though. We must submit to the Word of God. We must submit to the Spirit of God. We must submit to him working in our life, cutting away things that perhaps we like because they aren't good for us. I think Jeff's comments were timely. Dying to self. It's not something we like to do, but boy, we're called to it. If we're going to let the fruit of God come through us, we must be dying to self every day. We must submit to the Lord's pruning so we can bear fruit and perhaps even more fruit than we ever imagined, ever. You say, well, Pastor, I, I agree with you, but it's really hard sometimes. My life has been hard. It's just hard for me to see the fruit of love and joy and peace in my own soul. Do you remember the Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? He knew what was next. Humanly speaking, he did not want the nails in his, in his hands. Humanly speaking, he did not want the whip on his back. Humanly speaking, he did not want to be broken. But remember what he said? Father, yet not my will, but yours be done. We know that day that in the midst of the greatest emotional trial of the life of the Lord Jesus, he still loved people. He was willing to go to the cross. He still had the joy of the Lord, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. He was also at peace because he knew in God's will was perfect peace. There was an end that would accomplish God's plan. And he stayed the course with the fruit of the Spirit in his darkest hour. What we see very clearly today is this, that fruit on a tree is evident. Almost done. Fruit on a tree is evident. You see it. Driving through the, the, the out, outskirts of Bedestagi, we enjoyed seeing the fruit on the trees. So which of these nine fruits of the Spirit are visible in your life? Let's turn a corner and make it personal. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Are you as spiritually mature as you should be? Are the fruit of the Spirit coming out in your life? Are we mature because we're old? <laughs> Sometimes we get older and we stop producing like, a, like, like, like an older palm tree. We shouldn't stop producing fruit of the Spirit. We should continue until we die. Now maturity comes when we're willing to allow the Lord to clip away the unfruitful branches of our life laying aside the weights and the sins that so easily beset us so we can run with endurance the race set before us. 
The branches submit to the cutting of the husbandman. The branches know that what the husbandman wants is good for the fruit. God wants to work enough. He wants to cut away things that hinder his fruitfulness in us. So, let's go back to Jesus turning water to wine. He, the true vine from heaven, produced natural grape juice wine, that which had never been a seed, never was attached to a vine, never bore grapes and was never crushed, yet he created the best grape juice, the best wine ever tasted. It was so amazing that the master of the feast was stunned at how excellent this new wine that Jesus created tasted. Now, suppose you say, you know, Pastor, I want to produce more fruit in my Christian life. Great. Do you think we should start a school on fruit bearing? Maybe have some classes on how to love better. Maybe, maybe, maybe a Bible study on, on peace and how we can be more peaceful. Do you think if we, if we studied these things even more that we'd be able to put them into practice better? I'm going to suggest not necessarily. I'm going to suggest to you that studying these things is far less important than letting the Lord bring them through you. Because here's a question for you. If the Lord could make the best juice ever out of water that was never wine, wine that was never grapes, is he not able to produce that fruit in you, though it doesn't exist there today? This is the miracle of salvation. The result of that miracle is a continued miracle of the fruit of the Spirit coming through your life. So suddenly you say, man, I haven't haven't used profanity. I've not cursed in a week. I used to curse all the time. Man, what happened? Maybe the fruit of the Spirit got a hold of your tongue. Boy, I used to have such a lustful mind, and I could hardly talk without lustful words, and they've not been coming out. What's happened? Perhaps the fruit of the Spirit is bringing His goodness into you. And I was so short-tempered, I've not, I've not bit anybody's head off for a week. What's wrong with me? Well, maybe it's the fruit of the Spirit taking over your temper and your anger. This is what He does. He wants us to get out of the way. I forgot to put it up there for you. Do you think that when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, that as Jesus turned water into wine, he can also turn our hard hearts into sweet fruit for him? This, doesn't, this, this is a, a lifetime process, yes. But it's a lifetime surrender so the fruit can flow through us at God's call. Let's pray together. Lord, help us to continue to let you produce your fruit in us. You want to produce your fruit in us. You want to turn the water of our lives into into just the best wine ever. You want all of these nine aspects of your fruitfulness to come through us. You've attached us to yourself. You are the vine. And you want us to let you produce your fruit in us. Father, I pray we'd be a church that continually lets your fruit flow through us. May the world around us see Jesus in us and realize that we're just not normal. But may they want that which they see. Lord, may we allow you to prune our lives. May we allow you to cut away that which might hinder your fruitfulness in us. May we live every day dying to our flesh, submitting to your spirit that your fruitfulness might be in us. And like the beauty of a, of a tree in full fruit, may our lives reflect your beauty in us as our lives are filled with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. In your name we pray, amen.